Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. I'm Scott Bernstein. I'm here with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. Uh, ben is in the house. And uh, we just want to thank everyone for uh, watching us and listening to us and remind people to please follow us on social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and please subscribe to us. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube channel. Every time you follow us, like us, comment, it helps spread the word. And so we, we really appreciate that. And uh, we're, we're super excited today. We have a really special guest. I think our audience is really going to dig this. Um, we have Justin in the house, a.k.a. Mooch. And uh, from the Mondays with Mooch show, some of our audience may may recognize um, him from his, his uh, YouTube channel. And hopefully they follow that and watch that. How are you, Mooch? I'm doing great, man. Thank you guys so much for having me on. I've been a fan of the podcast for a little bit, so I'm excited to get on. Thanks, yeah, Matt. Yeah, uh, we really appreciate your time. I think I think just to let the audience know that I mean, we're hoping that this is kind of going to tip off a, a, a new era of, of OG Pod where we're giving you more uh, biker content. And, and Mooch was a member of the, the Bagos and the Mongols. And he's going to give us some insight uh, into that world. And we know that you guys love it. And, and we like bringing it to you. We haven't brought it brought as much content as we do with the other stuff but you know i'm i'm making a commitment to uh be giving giving the audience more consistent uh, biker content because there's a lot going on right now uh, in in the world of of uh of bikers and um i think this is a great segue into bringing justin on and and having him give us kind of the give us the rundown man because we're uh we're, we're still kind of novices i mean we're reporters but we, we've never been in the shit like you were right yeah yeah we appreciate and um you know we we um we know our audience enjoy episodes on, on outlaw bikers so we're happy to do that but i agree with scott i mean scott's reporter I, i'm a criminologist um neither one of us i mean I, I i you know i don't ride we're not members of clubs and, and i know sometimes in the comment section people beat us up about that and call us out about that but we find the subculture fascinating we find it important it's iconic we think it's interesting to talk out, talk about. We don't, we don't mean to disrespect people or offend people, you know, that are part of that world. Uh, we just think it's interesting to to discuss. So we appreciate when insight. I, mean, I just love the politics of it. I mean, forget about whether or not you ride or not. Forget about the blood and guts. Like, I, I just love, you know, analyzing and understanding the politics of groups like this. So. Yeah, from a sociological perspective, yeah. I think it's pretty interesting. So, um, but anyhow, Mooch, I mean, your life is is fascinating. We're going to go into it. We want to talk about your journey. You start off as this as this uh, punk rocker, hardcore kid. We, uh, hopefully, we can get into that a little bit. Uh, um, you get into some juvenile delinquency, if I if I may say, <laughs> and right. kind of a troublemaker. And then, uh, but you're you're uh, um, you know an enthusiast for motorcycles. You you get involved in that subculture to the extent that you actually become a member of of really prominent one percenter clubs, and then uh, we get to the point now where you are actually a, a counselor, an influencer, an author, a uh, motivational speaker. So just just your really full packed life here. Um, let's let's start from the beginning. I mean, let's let's start like um, you know like maybe the punk rock stuff before you get attracted to the one percent life. Yeah, man. I think. Um... You know, the cool thing with with working on this book that I'm doing is I get to kind of relive a lot of stuff from my youth and, and remember and, and really overthink things, I guess, that that a lot of times I'd probably forget. And, you know, I was talking with someone the other day about a lot of times when people get involved in gangs or clubs, it's, you know, they're out there looking for a family or, or that family connection. And, and that was never true for me, man. I've had a really great Italian family, very tight knit. Like we spend every Sunday together doing dinners and holidays. And, and so I, I think for me, I'm an identical twin. And I think for me, I was really searching for identity really early on, uh, trying to be different from my brother and, and kind of coming up with my own my own thing. And and so I got into punk rock at a pretty early age. I had an aunt um, that would take us on the I had, my, my mom was pretty young when she had us. So my aunt would keep us on in the summers and she would play like Madness and the specials and Clash and Sex Pistols and Ramones and all this cool stuff for us. And so I got into punk rock really early on. And, and I really started getting influenced by that. And I kind of started dressing that way and getting into that culture. Um, and then I started getting into more of like, you know, Cox Bar and some of that, that OI movement and that stuff. And um, one day in my freshman year of high school, I was wearing a T-shirt. It was a dead Kennedy shirt in the back, said Nazi punks fuck off. And there was a pretty big epidemic at my school at the time of these this neo-Nazi organization called Volksfront. Um, and, and they were causing a lot of issues. 
And and they pretty much, I wouldn't say they beat me up, but they pushed me around and kind of bullied me and they kept calling me a sharp. And I didn't know what that was. And the internet wasn't a thing back then. So I went to the uh, Pals bookstore up in Portland and I bought like every book I could about skinheads and the skinhead subculture. And I really got immersed in the whole like traditional anti-racist skinhead scene. And I spent probably 10 years of my life um, doing that I and mean, going to concerts and uh, fighting with with racists and ended up starting a band and touring the country for about five years and was really just kind of immersed in that scene for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 glad you brought that up. I, just a few weeks ago in my gangs and organized crime class, we have a lesson plan on extremist groups. And I, I always play music before class. I played DK's Nazi punks fuck off <laughs> before class. And I don't nice. think my students, and they're 18, 19 years old. I, most of them aren't punk rockers. They had never heard anything like that. So, uh, and then I also played uh, Big Takeover from Bad Brain. So I, I, I'm with you. I really enjoyed like the like politicized, politically charged punk rock and hardcore from that, from that era. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you know, it was a really violent scene and, and we were, looking back doing probably some things we weren't proud of and some pretty, you know, uh, heinous, violent stuff, but we were doing it like kind of under the guise of like social justice, right? Like to us, it wasn't necessarily gang on gang. Like we thought we were essentially, we were fighting racism. We were fighting these neo-Nazi skinheads, um, and going head to head with them. Um, so, so to us, we were doing some justified violence, right? And, and we thought it was, uh, we, we thought we were doing social work early on. But th doesn't that also kind of color up your eventual, membership in 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 not just outlaw one percent motorcycle groups but specifically vagos and mongols which kind of not kind of they push back on the notion that bikers are all you know white nationalist uh neo not you know the vagos and the the mongols have a lot of diversity in in their ranks for sure. And that's really, you know, once I really got into riding motorcycles, I did the similar thing where I went out and read every book there was about motorcycle clubs and all that stuff. And like I said, you guys remember the era of pre-internet, right? So you can really deep dive things on the internet. So you got to get books and talk to people involved. And so I, I really got into that culture. And one of the things that attracted me to the Vagos was just that there were a lot of dudes from the punk rock scene, a lot of skateboarders. Um, you know, they weren't all white guys. And the ones that were more, more kind of like punk rock, alternative white guys. And so at first that kind of felt like like the home for me. Um, you know, I jumped into it head first without knowing a lot about it and was pretty naive and a pretty impulsive kid back then. Um, and after about two years in that club, I realized it wasn't a really good fit for me. And I ended up moving on to the Mongols. And then I spent 15 years in the Mongols. But uh, one of the cool things about the Mongols was very similar. Like you said, you know, there's a, obviously are pretty well known for being a Hispanic club. But there was even when I joined, there's a lot more white guys in it now. But even when I joined, there was a handful. But a lot of them came from uh, that anti-racist skinhead scene, the punk rock scene, like we were talking off air, some of those dudes came from suicidal and, and kind of that crew. There was a lot of dudes um, that I met over the years that came from the, the anti-racist skinhead scene, like the Family Skins and Unity and a lot of these L.A. based skinhead crews that kind of graduated up and joined the club world, too. So there was a, a lot of basic connection there based off what we did before the club. Yeah, I mean, that's a it's a I think a, an interesting point that gets lost is because I think that um, there is the kind of stereotype that outlaw bikers are well, definitely in the midwest across. east coast down south where there's a lot of outlaws a lot of pagans hell's angels are kind of peppered in there um and those are the groups that are more nationalistic you got to go out west and into some of the flyover states to kind of be exposed to that so i mean we're going to get into this but like with you know mongols in the midwest they, they weren't here until five years ago and you know justin played a role in that um, and I just want to clarify before we jump back in, when you joined the Mongols, you joined, am I correct in saying that was like the mother club? Like that was the club that was kind of running the national Mongols. I started in Oregon. I, I um, I, I chartered the first chapter in Oregon, okay. pretty much every chapter in the Midwest over the couple of years. I ended up joining the mother chapter club, I think around 2011. So I was in mother chapter for about 10 years, but I started okay. out, started out in Oregon with some Oregon chapters. And uh, I, I want to ask her about that, too, but just I, I just also want to say for the record, again, I'm not an expert, but I have talked to both Hells Angels and Outlaws off the record who are not white supremacists. Oh, no, no. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be clear. I'm not saying that every member right, of those right, clubs right. But, but, hate black people right. or hate Jewish people. Or, that no, was I apologize if that's how it came out. You know, no, no, I don't think, these, so I don't like, think it was. Like I was saying, a lot of dudes come from that hardcore and punk rock scene. It, it was more based off where you live than it was what club. So what was the big club in your area? So. You know, in, in Sacramento and Northern California, there was some big hardcore and punk rock crews called you know, OBHC, Most Hated, 
And they ended up, a couple of them ended up joining the Angels, right? And, and these were guys I was friends with before that we just went opposite ways because of who was in our area. Um, Boston and upstate New York and all that, super tied into FSU, that FSU click from hardcore. Um, and so a lot of those dudes ended up joining the Outlaws. So there's still a lot of dudes from that that subculture that joins all the major clubs, just depending on on geographic region, really. But it, I would say to, to Scott's point, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Mooch, that one of the reasons why the, the Mongols – Banditos, Vagos emerged though was to fill a void. There was this sort of uh, exclusive yeah. uh, idea to some, especially the Hell's Angels. Whereas if if you um, were a person of color, you could you could have your own biker club. Is that was that part of the idea of it emerging or no? I don't th- honestly. I think that's more rumor than fact. I I think um, it was more based on your region. So you know, so Southern California has a lot of Hispanics in it, and the Hispanic guys were sticking together. Um, and they were the, the guys that started the Mongols um, were looking at some other clubs first and decided on joining their own. But the rumor that they couldn't join because they're Hispanic has proven not to be true. And, and I think when you guys had George Christie on, he talked about, you know, there's been other Hispanics in the in the Hell's Angels over the years. They've have you know, they have other nationalities in their group. Um, so I think that's just like a simple explanation. So people buy it pretty quick. Um, you know, the Banditos, even though I are Texas, they have a huge white. I mean, a lot of those are white guys, you know. Um, so I think it's more geographic and region, like where are you from? What, what's the, you know, what's the bigger demographic in that region? And that's, you know, those are the guys that grow up and join. Motorcycle. Contextually, yeah, makes sense. as I, as I mentioned before, I mean, Jimmy and I are, are from the Midwest. We're from Detroit and in Detroit, you have two major biker groups. You got the outlaws and you got the highwaymen, which is more of a homegrown. They're not super national, but right. if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the membership indexes, all the Hispanics in Detroit that are joining clubs are joining the highwaymen. They're not joining the outlaws. Mm. Right. Part of, that is, been, part of that is the highwaymen were founded on the Southwest side of Detroit, even though they were founded by white people. Southwest right. Detroit is where the Hispanic population. And that's is what from. goes to my demographic standpoint, because I have met a ton of Hispanics and outlaws as well. Um, and it'd be, I think it depends on the region, like where you grow up. Cause you know, all it really takes is one guy from your friend group to join a club. And next thing you know, you're riding with them, you're hanging out and then you start joining. So, you know, if it's a local thing and it's your neighborhood crew and that type of stuff, that's generally the guys that stick together and join together. Yeah, that's a great point. I appreciate your insight and in, in clearing that up. So let's go back to, you know, your your history here. Um, you say the Vagos, that wasn't a good fit for you. Do you want to expand on that? or? Um, you know, when I was in the skinhead world, we, we had a pretty uh, structured gang that we were in. And, and if our discipline was normally through violence. So if you messed up or you made a mistake, it wasn't like club world where it's a fine or you reprospect or whatever you were getting beat up. And so when I, when I left that, um, I really found that that undermined uh, brotherhood, you know, it was really hard. I know there's that old adage that friends can fight and have a beer and shake hands. And, um, but I just didn't see that to be true, even though we would still be cool. There was always some sort of resentment or, or underlying issues. Um, and so when I first started hanging out with the Vagos, you know, they had said that that Vagos weren't allowed to fight each other and put hands on each other. And, and like I said, I, I was more intrigued that it was a bunch of young guys just in a punk rock. And it, it, coming from Oregon, the biker scene was a lot of older guys listening to classic uh, traditional biker stuff that you would think, you know. Um, and when I first started hanging out at clubs in Oregon, I remember kind of sitting in this clubhouse looking around thinking, man, if it wasn't for wanting to be in a club, I don't have anything in common with any of these guys. Like, we don't listen to the same music. I wouldn't invite these guys for a barbecue. Like I liked them, but they were more like people you're happy to see when you're out. And we, we weren't on that level. Um, and the Vagos kind of showed me that there was more people that were kind of from my background or at least in a similar interest. So so I bought into that. Um, when I say it wasn't really for me, there was some leadership issues back then um, that I have heard have been uh, since been you know sorted out or fixed. But it just um, there was a leadership stuff. There was some stuff with fines that I didn't agree with. But honestly, what it really came down to is our chapter was having some issues with another chapter. And there was a church we were having about our safety and our security and, and what we were going to do with this meeting with this other chapter. And I remember thinking, why am I get, why am I going to be in a club where we're fighting other clubs and ourselves? And it, it didn't seem like a logical step. And, and, and because of that, and because I'd already known some Mongols, um, I was ready to make the move. And to be honest with you guys, back then the Vagos weren't as well known as they are now. They were on the come up and they were growing, but they weren't considered a one percenter club. They were still primarily in Southern California and Southern Oregon. Um, and so the Mongols was almost a step up. And I mean that with respect to the Vagos, but the Mongols were a step up at the time. They were a bigger club, a more dominant club. So it was almost like starting in a smaller club and then working my way up. At, at the point that you joined the Mongols, was uh, was Doc already the boss at that point? He was. I, I joined during Doc's big recruitment drive. And honestly, 
had I joined after that, I probably wouldn't be able to because for a long time we weren't allowed to take members from other major clubs in an agreement with the Vagos that we wouldn't take their members. Um, so I kind of came in at the right time for me where it was just really working out. Doc was really pushing recruiting. They were opening up uh, similar to what the Pagans have been doing over the last few years. The Mongols did that early on and they were just really opening up, you know, small chapters in different states just to kind of establish new areas. Can, can you give the the audience maybe a, just like a two minute primer on who Doc Cavazos uh, was or is? I mean, uh, I'll just preface it by saying, you know, he be, eventually became one of the most notorious biker bosses in America, uh, came, got busted in the, the big Operation Black Rain and isn't really in the club anymore. And there's a lot of questions about whether or not he cooperated, but at well, one he, point he, at, he, he cooperated. Yeah. He, he, he cooperated. signed statement. I mean, there's, right. there, I would never out, outright call anyone uh, an informant or say they cooperate without proof and paperwork. And, and in the discovery is 100% a doctor. But the point, but the point I'm trying to make is that at one point doc was as big as they came in that world. So I just kind of want you to tell the audience like who this guy was the first time you met him, what you thought of him, stuff like that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'd only, I was only in the club under him for about a year, but I will say, I mean, he was a really charismatic guy. Um, he was very likable. I mean, he had a lot of really strong leadership skills, right? And regardless of how things played out, um, I do think he did some good for the club initially. You know, he kind of, at, at the time when he took over, you know, the Mongols were uh, down to a few, you know, a few members that were still in that really old school vibe. Dudes were doing meth and beating each other up and kind of running people off and um, Doc really changed that culture. And, and Doc really started to bring in that new generation of Mongols that I came in under. Um, so he did a lot of positive things and really started help for with growth and stuff like that. I say my first impression is I was at a big, it was my first big Mongol run. And like I said, one of the things I didn't like about the Vagos was, was um, like some fines and stuff. And some of the guys, the, the Terry, the tramp, their national P if he, if he had like jewelry, he liked, Usually he would try and take it or tell you to give it up. And I remember, so that was my experience with club stuff, right? So I see Doc going around to each t-shirt booth, chapter booths, looking at shirts and they would give him a shirt and he would try and pay for it. And I remember thinking, wow, that's cool. Cause that's a polar opposite from what I just saw. Um, so, you know, he, he seemed like a brother, like that guy that really cared about the members and cared about each other. Um, I didn't know him enough to say much more than that, but I, I, I can say, Although he single-handedly almost ruined our club by giving away our trademarks and and doing some pretty backhanded stuff, um, he did bring a lot of guys into this club, help us establish a new area, and, and kind of revamp the style of the Mongols. Can I ask you a back? I'm again really interested in just the subculture and understanding the sociology of it. Um, if if you are patched over member of a club and you want to transfer to another, you said. I mean, the, the politics of it. I mean, how, how well does that go over? I mean, obviously you were able to do it. And is, are there moments where sometimes people don't take that kindly? Or I mean, how, how does that work? It didn't go over well when I did it either. Um, okay, so okay. When, when I did it, I brought um, four or five guys with me in Oregon and then a couple guys in um, Vegas and two in Nevada. And eventually I ended up bringing the whole Shasta County Vago chapter two. So I ended up bringing probably close to 20 guys with me when I did it. So not only was it kind of a slap in the face that I had left and joined another club, but then I took a bunch of guys with me. Um, that was the first time in my life where I'd ever been, had the FBI show up to my house and tell me there was a contracted hit on my life. I never thought that stuff was real. I, honestly, I don't even know how serious I took it then. Um, but that was the first time anything like that's happened is, is you know, they have to, they have a, a duty to protect or to warn you if, if they know that you're in imminent danger. And he showed it to my mom's house and, and told us that the Vagos had a hit on us. So I, I can't tell you that's true. I'm not going to speak to that, but I, I will say that, um, that's how it went over, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a pretty good sign that it wasn't a smooth transition. Okay. For sure. <laughs> well, that, that and, answers the question. And, and let's just, uh, break it down a little bit even more. Cause there's, I think there's layers to this because there's the, there's the patching over from one, either semi major group or major group to another major group, which I guess if you want to make a sports analogy, it would be like, you know, the Chicago bears trading a quarterback to the New York giants. But there's, I think, the, tell me if I'm wrong, the more traditional patching over is when smaller clubs that don't have the notoriety or the muscle or whatever are absorbed, yeah. would be a way to say it. And then the entire group, whatever they're called, becomes the Mongols. Correct. Yeah, that's that's the, the common way. And like I said, um, the Vagos weren't as big as they were now, and they would. It wasn't quite that clear cut, but it was a similar where it was going stepping up to a major club, to a bigger club. 
for sure. Because that's part of, and we'll get into this in a second, but he referenced the pagans and this expansion that they're um, undertaking in the last five, six years. And some of it is in conjunction, at least my report, he says it's in conjunction with some of the Mongols. And the pagans, this expansion is being fueled by uh, Conan the Barbarian Richter, who's the kind of the head of the snake here, going around to smaller, lesser known clubs uh, at least starting to do that in the East Coast and uh, um, New England and some parts going up towards the Midwest where he's just, I know that in, in Providence, Rhode Island, there was a group called the Thug Riders. And now the Thug Riders are just, that's the Providence Mongols. Like, they, like Derek McGuire, who was the president of the Thug Riders. The pagans, you mean? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, he was president of the Thug Riders, and then he made an uh, agreement with with Conan. He traveled from Providence to uh, see Conan in, in either New York or New Jersey, and they agreed that all of the Thug Riders. That was just as far as I know. I think it was just that chapter because there's still a lot of Thug Riders. Oh, okay, well, just that. Oh, I'm sorry. The pro, that pagans. one chapter became the Mongols. No pagans. Sorry, pagans. <laughs> wow. Yes, pagans. Right. Um, yeah. I mean that that's pretty standard or pretty common. And if you look at the history, even you know, in the 50s and 60s, that was really common for the Hells Angels. You know, they're, they're not just grabbing guys off the streets in a new state. You're getting people that are already established, that already know people, that are already kind of running some sort of, you know, motorcycle club um, structure or, you know, have, have some inroads there. And then, you know, you see if they're worth it and if they're good guys and how dedicated they are. And then you ended up, you know, they either a prospect or patch over, however each club does it. But a lot of times that's how it works is you're finding another club that was already established and then bringing them into the quote unquote big leagues. Yeah, it makes sense. So uh, tell us about, you know, before you start to expand and go to the Midwest, tell us about your life now on the West Coast. Now you're an established Mongol. Tell us about, you know, that that part of, of your life. Man, the first year was pretty crazy. So, you know, I, I joined the Mongols. I'm still, you know, just for clarity, I joined the motorcycle club because I love motorcycles. Um, and then obviously coming from, you know, skinhead and gang culture stuff, I like the brotherhood and the aspect with it. Um, but I've never been like an organized crime dude, you know, there, there's not a lot of that going on. And so I was doing this based off my love for motorcycles. And so when we started in Oregon, um, there wasn't, there's a lot of really good clubs in Oregon. They're very old. They've been there for a long time, but they weren't clubs. Like I said before, that really jived with me, like clubs that I considered that I would be a good fit for. So I decided to start the Mongols there. Um, and the major clubs in Oregon had an agreement with all the other major clubs that there would be no other big clubs in Oregon. So they pretty much all banded together to try and keep us out. Um, and within the first couple months of us being there, the Oregonian, the big newspaper there, did a huge story about it, pretty much making it look like we were at war with the Gypsy Jokers and these other clubs. Um, it was pretty tense. There was It wasn't like we just popped up and got to kick it. Um, things things were pretty hectic. Um, I learned a lot, at, you know, during that era. Um, and then the other hard part was, you know, we were new to a state, so the, the cops and the feds were very heavy on us, too. We had um, two informants in our first chapter. And at the time, you know, I was pretty naive. I, I honestly, I obviously I knew about like undercover cops and stuff, but I didn't know about this whole um, informant game, which is huge now. Um, Cause these dudes, I've always, every chapter I've ever had, we've had a no meth policy and these informants were doing meth and we were taking them to rehab and trying to clean them up. So I just kept thinking, man, these guys are more criminal than us. So there's no way they're telling on people. And, and so it turned out they were informants. So they always had ATF for following us around. And then um, when that newspaper article came out, things were getting pretty heated. And I was leaving my my parents live on 150 acres and I was staying out there on their farm. And when I was leaving one day, there was an all blacked out SUV coming up my driveway and I was in a car or a truck. And I followed them off the driveway and followed them for a while trying to see who they were. And they drove to the Gypsy Joker Clubhouse. So, you know, you can imagine that I'd assume that this was enemies and this was an issue. Um, and then they left there and they headed south and I followed them for over an hour. And what I did is I called some of the other guys from the Eugene chapter and said, hey, this car, well, every time I tried to get up si alongside of them and look in to see who they were, they wouldn't let me see them. Uh, they, I mean, they were 100 percent trying to evade me. So I figured maybe if there were some other cars on the road, they didn't recognize me. They can get a look in. So I had a couple other guys meet me on the road. And once we got to Eugene, someone, one of the guys pulled up next to him and they hit their lights and it turned out they were ATF agents and an undercover uh, gang detective. And they busted me for attempted kidnapping and conspiracy to commit kidnapping. So. I stayed in jail for uh, two or three months on, on uh, well, started out 14 million and then it went down to a $1.4 million bail. So obviously I stayed in there um, and I fought that case and I beat it at trial. I got found guilty of reckless driving and menacing, which were misdemeanors. 
but the because my crime was against law enforcement, they were pretty strict on the punishment. So I got five years felony gang probation. And part of that was non-association with the club. So here I had been in the club about eight months and I wasn't allowed to affiliate with them anymore. Um, and since there was informants in the chapter, which we didn't know at the time, every time I affiliated, I'd get caught and go back to jail for one or two months at a time. And I ended up doing about a full year on and off from getting caught by associating, going back and forth. And that's um, when I decided to move to San Diego. I knew that with a misdemeanor warrant, they likely wouldn't extradite me. Um, and then within that first year being in the club, so I did that. And then Operation Black Rain hits. And, you know, almost all the Mongols that I knew or came in under or was in chapter with were arrested in Black Rain. So that first year was real tumultuous, man. And there, there was a lot of up and downs and a really big learning curve. That was 2008, just for people to uh, get a timeline here. Operation Black Rain was one of the D8 ATF's uh, biggest busts of the last three decades and took down a ton of leadership in the Mongols and it hit in 08. Yeah, I joined, I joined in um, November of 2007, and then Black Rain was October of 2008. So all of that stuff that happened to me, um, plus there was a, an or a, there, when I joined, unbeknownst to me being a white guy from Oregon, the club was having a, a disagreement with another well-known organization. So um, outside of the motorcycle world. So there was a lot going on that first year, you know, and it <laughs> said it was a pretty big learning curve pretty quick. Would you say it's accurate that now that you have, you know, uh, there's a gap of time in between the thought process that you had in, let's say, the mid 2000s or late 2000s. And then now saying that, you know, these guys were all drugged out and we were helping them get to rehab. So that made me, I'm, I'm saying what you said, that made right. me think, no, there's no way they're informants. Now, would you say that if, the, if this happened to you today, you'd have the opposite reaction, say these guys are definitely informants. Yeah, definitely, man. There was a lot of red flags that like to this day, I'll say I ignored them, but honestly, I just didn't recognize them. I didn't have that experience with stuff like that. All I knew about undercover cops was like what I saw in movies and stuff, right? Like it's not something that the general culture, you know, deals with. Um, so I was just kind of learning as I go. And and these guys were actively pursuing and pushing us to do illegal activity on a regular basis. They were trying to get us to steal motorcycles. They were trying to instigate issues with the other clubs in the area. Um, and like I said, the other clubs didn't want us there, but we were doing sit downs and, and being fairly cordial. Our communication was was good. And these guys would want to go out and start smacking them around. And and, and real, they were just trying to instigate a lot of things. Um, and looking back, yeah, it was, it was pretty obvious for the fact that, you know, the rest of the guys in the group weren't criminals. And these guys were trying to do and get people to do criminal stuff. Um, they, they were like openly saying, hey, I'm a felon. Can anyone sell me a firearm? And like uh, I remember one of them had asked me if if, uh, if he called me over the phone and yes, he, he said like, hey, for the chapter, I have this idea. I've got this guy that can change VIN numbers. Why don't we start stealing bikes, switching VIN, selling bikes? And I remember saying, dude, that's A, it sounds like a headache and B, it doesn't sound worth it. Like that, we're not going to do that. And then when I got my discovery from the case, one, which coincidentally was the detective that I supposedly tried to run off the road, says, yeah, I was here with confidential informant number four and he asked Mooch to steal bikes. And Mooch said, yeah, good idea. And so it's like, there was this back and forth where, they were in order to get paid, they had to show that there was criminal stuff happening. Right. And I imagine that we were pretty boring to hang out with because, you know, outside of, you know, partying, at, going out in bars and being stupid out of bars. We, I'm sure frat boys were doing more criminal stuff than us. So I, I think it got frustrating for them to a point that they really started pushing stuff pretty heavy. I think the general public doesn't really have an understanding of the informant game. Everybody like what Mooch is saying, like they think of a movie or a television show where somebody gets on a witness stand and points a finger when in reality, 90 percent of the informants are what they call dry snitches, where you're just given information in exchange either for leniency or actual you know, cash transactions. And you're never going to have to get up on a witness stand. Yep. Yeah. Neither one of these ever had to take a witness stand too many. Yeah. You know, a lot of people involved took plea bargains or some of it was just information. Right. We were a new club. So they were they were feeding information to the gang cops about how many members we had and how often we did church and, you know, just the simple information. But they were they were giving up all this information, getting paid four thousand dollars a month to do it. Um, and I think what the public doesn't understand is that it's a lot of these informants that are instigating the criminal activity. That's the frustrating part, you know, because then then. You know, it's they entrapment. get it's entrapment. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, one of these informants was still around right after Black Rain and then um, kind of got outed right after that. But during a time where the Mongols weren't allowed to wear their patches, he was making Mongol shirts and giving them to these like tweaked out dudes in his town so that when they got caught, they'd say Mongols were busted with meth or this and that. So it was, you know, it was making everyone look bad, but they weren't real Mongols and they weren't anything a part of the affiliation. And it's it's this, uh, you know, smear campaign 
and it's it, you know done by law enforcement and the media and everybody else but it's organized and it's structured and it's by these guys that are p- getting paid to do this for a living yeah and i think to you guys you know have more knowledge about this than i do but maybe something else that people if they're just want, getting this knowledge from tv shows or movies when we're talking about informants, these aren't undercover cops. Right. These aren't guys that went to the police academy right. or these or are criminals these are that right, are hedging that, their bets that agreed to yeah. as part of their their deal agreed to to infiltrate. Um, no, uh, a, a these are chapter. active criminals that are right. trying to like watch their backs by cooperating with the people that are trying to investigate them. In some cases, getting paid millions of dollars, um, and then in the in the court documents, very rarely does it ever say, you know, Jim Smith was the cooperator. It will say CI. Yeah, it says CI five. three or CI four yeah. or whatever. The only reason I know who it is is obviously, like I said, I spent time with these guys, which yeah. makes it pretty obvious. But yeah, that's exactly what happened. And you know, the second one, I'm not really sure how he got into being an informant, but I know the first one was caught doing stealing bikes, doing illegal stuff, and so for a lenient sentence, he decided to start cooperating. And he, both of them, joined the Mongols with the full intent of being informants. They weren't like Mongols that got caught doing illegal stuff. They specifically joined to inform on us. And Which I, a... I do think speaks volumes to the fact that we weren't doing illegal activity, considering we had two informants with us for several years. Um, and we only had one guy got busted. And, and it's very unfortunate. This guy had done 15 years, got out, was getting clean, prospected, joined the Mongols. And this informant kept asking to borrow money, borrow money. So we loaned him some money. And the informant said, man, I'm not comfortable just borrowing money. Without some collateral, why don't you hold on to this pistol for me? And he got fell in possession of a firearm and selling a firearm. And since he did so much time, he did 15 more years after that. I mean, it's like you said, it's entrapment. It's, you know, here a guy is thinking this is a brother. I'm trying to help him out, loan him some money. And now he's doing 15 years, you know? Well, I think another thing that people should know is that, and this is playing off of, of the narrative that, that Mooch just laid out there. The biggest targets for law enforcement looking to flip criminals are drug addicts and believe me one of the enticement factors for these drug addicts or or druggies they're getting they're getting drugs from the from the law enforcement law enforcement's feeding the habit so they don't have to pay for the drug they're getting paid money from law enforcement for what they're doing and they're getting free drugs and the part that people don't understand is these guys, like we were saying before, if you're getting a paycheck or you're getting drugs and that now that's your job or that's your hookup and illegal things aren't happening, of course, you're going to either say they are if they're not or start instigating them. Mm-hmm. So you're not really uh, protecting or, or, you know, f- following the law. You're, you're instigating and you're getting people to break the law so that you can justify a paycheck. And that's where it gets really cloudy. And, and you know, these newspaper articles come out where like, yeah, all these motorcycle gangs got arrested for this and that. And they have no idea how many times those are informants that are just stirring the pot or creating crimes. Yeah, if the, it seems like from a criminal justice policy perspective, the, the system is flawed to the extent that you're going to have someone put them in a position where they're going to tell you what you want to hear. And if you're Uncle Sam, and you've got this junkie informant and, and they know that you want to hear that Mooch or whomever is, is up to no good, they're going to they're going to they're going to tell them that. Right. right? And, and they'll figure out some flimsy Mickey Mouse way to to entrap you well they say i mean i've heard cops tell me you know (laughs) i've hung out with just as many criminals as i have cops law enforcement fbi atf eda i've had these guys and these are decorated federal law enforcement admit to me i mean off the record admit to me yeah we trumped up that charge yeah we lied but our thinking is we go into court we go we jump on the stand they're going to believe us over the, the then they're going to believe the guy in the, on the defense table. And that works 99.9% of the time. And to, you know, them, to them, the end justifies the means they, f- they firmly believe in their mind that they're getting rid of criminals. So they want to do what it takes to get rid of criminals. You know, the, the, uh, the frustrating or unfortunate part about these informants is a lot of times what they're reporting is happening is what ends up going into these police trainings and these gang trainings. And so, on. And so there's these, this repeated, repeated law enforcement narrative that isn't necessarily correct in a lot of different, you know, a lot of different cases, or maybe this is something that happened in the seventies. One cop happened. So now you got like, I know you guys have done some of those trainings. You go to these gang trainings and they're repeating things that aren't, are far from fact, but it's just because of their source of information. So it has a really big impact, you know, on a national scale. It's not like it's just affecting the people in the chapter or whatever. Yeah. And, and, you know, as a social scientist, you know, I want to collect data. And so I've undergone some of this training and, and we do 
you know, we'll have similar conversations with, with members of law enforcement. And so that's why I think it's really important to talk to guys like you and George, and we've had big Pete on. And, I mean, I've uh, one of the first to get both to get, to have, to have, to have balance, because I agree with you when you, when you undergo that training, I'm just telling you the, your, your, your instructors are people from law enforcement, whatever. I'm, I'm not trying to talk shit. I'm just being matter of fact that they will tell you and teach you that biker clubs are the same thing as MS-13 or the Italian mafia or whatever. Um, and they'll use some of these examples that you're talking about. You know, what's a, a funny kind of paradigm for me. And, and, and I, I wonder if they understand this narrative, but if you're going to push the narrative that motorcycle clubs are organized crime, just like the mafia, and they're doing it with a patch on visible for everyone to see, you either have to agree that a, you're terrible at your job as a police officer, because you know, there's these, Thousands, hundreds of thousands of criminals out here just breaking the law under your nose, or you have to admit that they're not breaking the law. But there, you, you can't really have it both ways. And I think that's the funny, the funny thing about their their whole thought process on this is here's this huge organized crime, but it's not secretive like the mafia was. They know who we are. Everyone's wearing patches. You know, everyone's on social media advertising where they're at, where they've been. So how can they be prolific gang members and then not be getting caught and still be supposedly be organized crime or? What's more believable, they're just not committing <laughs> organized, well, I think you know, organized crime. Jimmy, you made a great point. I don't remember if you made this on the podcast or when we were having a conversation, uh, you know, just us in private. But, you know, you have a situation here where you might have a, a, a club of, let's say, there are 100 members in the Detroit West Side Outlaws. And there might be 10, 20 members that are legitimately doing criminal activity. Now that doesn't mean that the other 80 or whatever percentage it is are involved in some huge racketeering conspiracy. Right. And it's like, it's, it's difficult to parse. And then you have the perception coming from whether it be a small percentage or a medium percentage, but it's not everybody in the group. I mean, I know from my study, my studying the groups around here, I can't speak to what's going on in California or in Portland, but in the groups around here, yes, a lot of these guys are out of central casting what you would look and think and act like a biker and are criminals. But there are also guys that work nine to five jobs that want to be part of a club. They don't see it necessarily as engaging in criminal behavior. And they're not engaging in criminal behavior other than being a part of a club that where there are some people that engage in criminal behavior. I think the distinction is that even if there's some members that are doing illegal stuff, they're not paying a percentage of their profits to the larger organization. So right. it's not going up the ladder. Now I agree that clubs have been plagued with stuff like that for a long time, but I would also say seventies and eighties, most likely maybe some early nineties, but the, the culture has shifted so much with the popularity of motorcycles and motorcycle clubs that way more middle-class nine to fivers are joining motorcycle clubs than the old, uh, Hey, I'm going to be a biker 24 seven. And if I have to sell dope, so I don't have to have a job, I'm going to do that. That's not really a thing anymore. So I think a lot of what they're training and teaching is very behind the times too. Cause you know, I'm, I wasn't around then, but I can promise you from what I've heard and read and what you guys have heard and read, it's probably true. People are doing some shady stuff back then, but it's not true now. And I know when little Dave took over the Mongols, one of the first rules we inst instituted was everyone has to have a visible mean income for that exact reason. Everyone had to have, either a nine to five or some sort of settlement or some way to show their, that they're making legal money because if it takes one guy to get caught doing illegal stuff, it makes us all look bad. So let's uh, use that as a segue to get into more modern times. And you mentioned little Dave, uh, little Dave was, w was he doc's direct successor or was there someone in between doc and little Dave? There was two guys in between him and little Dave, but within a year. Okay, so um, Little Dave was the face of the Mongols. He was the national president throughout most of the 2010s. I think about 2010 until just this yeah. last year. And then it's this has been in the news. We're not we're not breaking the story. Uh, there was an indictment. The trademark it, it was a big deal about whether or not the Mongols were going to lose their trademark, uh, lose the copyright, and then it it came out from Little Dave's girlfriend or wife uh she had recorded little dave uh she was upset with him she like kicked him out of the house because he was sleeping with another woman and he was trying to beg for her to come back and she's recording him and while she's recording him it sounds like he's admitting to her that he is a 
ATF informant and that his contact in the ATF, this guy that he had known for years, uh, was leaving the ATF at the end of the year and that they would have no long they would no longer have protection. She brings this tape to the Mongols. He's kicked out of the club. Eventually, they get their trademark back. Uh, but little Dave has done some interviews, I think, in the last year where he's insisting this was a miscommunication. And- well, there was a, there was that last court date. So the the trademark thing that you're talking about is actually still an extension from 2008 Black Rain. So that initial um, thing, the first judge ruled that uh, an injunction against the patch and no Mongol was allowed to wear the patch, have anything that said Mongols on it. Um, and then it didn't take long before they decided that was un- unconstitutional. Ever since then, the government's been appealing it or the Mongols are appealing one way or the other. So these have been appeals that have been going on since 2008. Um, where the Little Dave thing got relevant in court was uh, the attorney came back and said, hey, listen, if we can prove Little Dave was an informant, then it's going to be pretty likely that we can show that we didn't get a fair trial since he was the main guy on this, you know, that been fighting the case. He was he was the president during the whole trial. So he was kind of the face of the, the organization. He made the calls with the attorneys. Um, so they thought that they had a leg to stand on. What I think is relevant for Little Dave in this case is that, you know, every Every bit of evidence was overturned. I mean, you know, came out of the woodwork. They they interviewed every single, uh, you know, L.A. County Sheriff's Department, Police Department, uh, FBI, ATF, everybody. And there's zero record of Little Dave ever cooperating, ever providing information and, and ever being an informant. And, and you know, the, the case that that was thrown out, um, which, you know, to Dave and a lot of us see that as vindication and the fact that there was other than a, a, a tape made by a scorned woman that I would agree didn't look good. Um, there's zero proof that he ever cooperated with law enforcement at all. But but by then the wheels were spinning. He was out of the club and, you know, politics changed by then. So and there's context. We've seen this in the Italian mob as well. I, I can think of a situation in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts with Big Al Bruno, where he just happened to have a conversation with an FBI agent. He probably shouldn't have the conversation. He wasn't cooperating. He just knew this guy as a guy that had been following him around for 20 years. They ran into each other at a pizza place they were both picking up pizzas and as they're waiting for their pizzas they start having a conversation i don't think bruno ever thought what he was saying to this fbi agent is going to make its way into a, a a court document and he made a comment to him about somebody that had gotten made or gotten a button and the fbi agent's like i got this from al bruno well then it gets into a court document and everybody's taking the document and and showing it around and going up to New York and being, look, Al's cooperating. Well, he wasn't cooperating. Yes, he got loose-lipped with an FBI agent, but he wasn't cooperating. So with little Dave, he obviously knew this ATF agent. I think he had known him since- It was it was the same ATF agent that had been in every national run. I mean, he was yeah. the one, first of all, he's been the main one to ever be involved in pretty much all motorcycle investigations. He's been doing it forever. Um, and, and second of all, he's he's the main face of of that that organization when it comes to, um, you know, all their investigation stuff. So anytime there was a big Mongol party, national run, he was the one always showing up. So everyone was familiar with that guy. Right. Um, and, you know, George Christie even said, I think on his interview with you guys, how, you know, there's always one cop that's usually assigned to whatever group or that chapter and no one's friends with them, but they know each other. Right. You're running into each other all the time. Uh, hey, you guys are going to behave this weekend. Right. You know, there's that cat that. that I wouldn't say casual, but you know what I'm saying, that that basic conversation. Um, And and I think that's been normal in clubs over the years, but when it's used, you know, it could also be used against you pretty quickly. I I would say the caveat to your story versus Dave's is there's not a shred of paperwork that ever shows Dave ever said anything, um, which which is, you know, why we would say he he, he was vindicated. Um, But he did, you know, I can't say that that I agree or disagree with the the quote unquote relationship he had, um, but it was a familiar as, and they saw each other all the time. Yeah, let me uh, let me pick up on something else I want to ask you about. Um, just from a civil libertarian perspective, the idea that the government would try to ban the um, you know uh, the logo of being a, a, a Mongol. And this is something Scott and I talked about months ago, just privately. I remember he he was telling me that that Uncle Sam was trying to do that, and I remember texting back, "Well." Isn't there? It, call me crazy. I'm not a lawyer, but isn't there a First Amendment issue here, like like freedom of assembly There's and no, freedom? Of freedom it's not of illegal speech. to be a part of a motorcycle club. It's well, illegal to do, to do something illegal in furtherance of a conspiracy within that club. And the right. government took that leap where they essentially made it look like a corporation, like McDonald's or or it's like all the hedge fund stuff or whatever that they were able to to use to take the copyright 
or to take the patch trademark because it was used in furtherance of the organization. So you're right. They can't do it. And, and the, the you know, it's been proven in the justice system now that they can't do it. But it had to go to the Supreme Court to get there. I mean, the, the, at this time, a judge was willing to try it. The, the, and the government was trying really hard to push it. And I think a lot of people don't realize how much world cooperation there is in motorcycle club law enforcement. Um, and a lot of the American ATF has been involved in a lot of these laws that are being passed in Australia and Germany where that are banning patches. So they're kind of trying to see what works where. And then, you know, thankfully we have a constitution and it's harder to do those things here, but it's not for lack of trying. And they definitely gave it uh, their all. I mean, they've been, this case is still ongoing and it started in 2018. And you know, if you something else that that is interesting, you mentioned is that the, the, sorry, <laughs> yeah, this is great. This, that the paradigm is over. So, like, if law enforcement is still using this paradigm from the seventies and eighties to, um, you know, in terms of what what their policies are now, that, that that's archaic. And but I, I think how that works is how I would explain it to my students, who some of them are CJ majors. Is you know once it becomes institutionalized, like you said, there's like one dude who's kind of like in charge of it. And I'm not trying to shit talk this person. I don't know that. I don't know that agent. But like, um, like um, institutions, it takes a long time for them to update and reform and change their ways. And if it becomes institutionalized, like this is the paradigm we're going to see. Uh, one percenter clubs. Um, it, it it could take decades for it for it to change. Um, I mean, and and. If you, we even see this a little bit with like um, with like New York. Like, if this is the way the FBI makes headlines, they want to bust Italian guys. They just bust. They don't care. Yeah, they don't care if they're geriatrics that have one foot in the grave, <laughs> right. and that all the money they put into building that case is going to be wasted because the guy's going to be dead in a year, which is what happened a couple right. of years ago with, with the Columbos. They spent all this money to, to take down and the they, Godfather, and Andy. For, uh, the, the recent one, they got the guys for running. Uh, some some sports betting, which yeah. is pretty much legal now, anyhow. Right. Uh, but but that becomes the that's the for paradigm. promotion. They get promotions, right? Even if it's right. an outdated paradigm. If you could, I think comment, I think the money is an important part that is often overlooked. You know, there's these gang experts that get paid extra to be experts. They get paid extra to teach at these, you know, to go in front of law enforcement and do these other, you know, these different trainings. Um, and because a they're from law enforcement and b they're labeled experts, they have a position of authority. So people are just going to believe what they say, you know, and especially other law enforcement new recruits. You know, you're going to think, oh, this guy's been in the game a long time. He knows what he's talking about. Um, and, and so that's how that gets spread and, and absorbed so easily. But the hard part is, is these dudes are getting paid to be experts. They're often uh, applying for funding, you know, saying, oh, this is such bad in our in our area, in our city. This motorcycle gang is such a big deal. We need more officers. We need more equipment. So there's a lot of money tied in to the narrative that law enforcement or that motorcycle clubs are, are, are criminal gangs because that's, you know, people are making money off it. They're starting units over it. There's big investigations over it. So, you know, it'd be really hard pressed for them to come out and say, you know what, the last several years, they haven't really been doing that stuff um, because people are going to be out of jobs and be making less money. And, and I think people overlook that. Yeah. When, and um, one thing that when I, I assigned to my class is the, to look at the FBI gang report. I think the most recent one is 2016. And I say, OK, let's look at the key findings. And all the key findings are gang crime is up. Outlaw motorcycle clubs are more dangerous than ever. Um, and I asked my students before we even get into like the, the, the data and like the methodology, which, which, which Mooch knows he's a scholar. We haven't even got to that yet, but what we will, um, so Mooch, you know, understands that before we even get into like the meth, the methods of collecting the data, I asked my students, what, what would you expect the FBI to say? <laughs> what would you expect the DOJ to say? Do you think they're going to release a report that says, Everything's cool. It's done. There's no, yeah. We've conquered the problem. It's over with. No, We're right. all retiring. What would, what would you expect them? What would you expect hey, the, them? the war on drugs is over. I guess we can close down the DEA. Yeah. yeah. Of course, they're not going to say it, right? <laughs> of course, right. So, and 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 I then I ask my students, you know, I, you know, you don't you don't have to just be skeptical because I'm asking you to be, but sometimes you have to recognize that with any source, there's an agenda. Right. And then you have to break it down and look at the nuances and look at how the data is collected and things like that. For sure. So that just reminds me of that when, you know, he said, yeah. yeah, there's an incentive, a financial incentive that the resources are tied to these certain narratives that may be outdated. So, and then the guy pushing the narrative is a respected guy in law enforcement. So the rest of law enforcement just eat it up. No one questions it. And then it just keeps getting passed along and passed along. There's such, I, I can't overemphasize this in, in my now going on 17, 17, 18 years of doing this. Um, there's such a thin line at the highest level of law enforcement and the criminals that they 
pursue. And, yeah. and some of them will be honest about it. I mean, Giovanni Rocco, uh, who's, you know, one of the most decorated undercover FBI agents who took down the DeCalvicante family in he New Jersey. He started off as a biker. But he, he said, but he also, he said to me, he's like, I have no problem saying this. If I didn't become a law enforcement, if I hadn't become a member of law enforcement, I would have been a really good mob boss. I would have been a really good biker boss. That's what I would have done if I hadn't have gone in this direction. Um, so it's it, these guys, I used to take everything that the government told me as gospel. I got bit so many times early in my career. Uh, they, they, they lie just as much, if not more, they mold a narrative that they want. They tickle the wire. I got you. I mean, I remember right. early in my reporting, I got used by the, the FBI in Chicago. They kept on telling me that there was a bus coming down. I kept on writing about this bus. Is, they were just using it to tickle the wire for the guy that was the target. Uh, and, you know, it's been 10 years later. He's never been arrested. <laughs> but I look well, bad. You know, by like record. shows like Gangland that t- comes out now, that comes out now was funded by the ATF to A, get guys to commit, you know, talk about on TV, obviously to talk about crimes. But also, coincidentally, we're coming out right before big raids to potentially, you know, influence jury pools. I mean, they've been doing that that type of stuff, influencing the media for a long time, and they're good at it. That's a good point. So um, now back to your experiences. So you're in SoCal. And but eventually you make your way to the Midwest. And that's kind of want to pick up on that. Like that brings us into modern day and some of the stuff that I've been reporting. So I, I'm, I'm interested in this part of our conversation. This will probably uh, you know wind us down here. But you, you were at the forefront of the Mongols coming into the Midwest. I know I reported something around that time period because I had I had people uh, in Detroit telling me that there was a some type of uh rally uh bike rally in in michigan where there were a bunch of mongols and they had never seen mongols before and i remember reporting that and then i didn't really report anything on the mongols being in the midwest until 2022 so just kind of maybe take us tell us what you know what what part you played in it and what kind of the overall idea behind it okay yeah so i was in i did i finished up my undergrad in la and went back to oregon to finish graduate school um, so then by then I was trying to kind of get a job in the field and, um, kind of a, a funny caveat to that is, so, you know, I'm a mental health therapist. I have my master's degree in social work and I was going to do my, uh, internship at the, the U- or- Oregon youth authority. I was going to be a counselor for the kids in the youth authority. And they sent me an address to, tr- for where this training is and a check-in for training. And I didn't think anything of it. And I nabbed it that morning and I get there all excited for training. And I look up and I'm at the, <laughs> I'm at the uh, police academy, the Oregon state police academy. So, uh, you know, I'm walking in thinking I'm just being arrogant. No one here is going to know who I am. And I guess I walked back past the state chief of police as I walked in. And I think I made it through half a day before they pulled me out and <laughs> kicked me out of there. Um, and I got fired from the internship for being a member. You know, they just asked me, are you a member of the Mongols? And I said I was. Um, and I was I was fired. So I sued the state and I won because um, I sued the state for discrimination. But even though I won, it was all over the paper, right? It was all over the news that this Mongol was in social work and sued the state. So finding a job was starting to be pretty difficult. At the time, I was getting really, really heavy into jujitsu. And I met um, a jujitsu team that's out of Mount Vernon, Illinois, that I was really getting along with and really wanted to start training with. And then my wife, who was just my girlfriend at the time, she was starting to go uh, get into grad school for um, dietetics and nutrition. And w- she was going to go to Oregon State. And when we were looking at it, SIU, Southern Illinois University, had a, had a really good program, too. So things just kind of lined up where we thought about just moving out here and giving it a shot. And I think the funny part of that is I was actually, so at the time I was overseeing all of the Northwest for the Mongols. I was overseeing all of the out of country chapters um, at a lot of my plate. And so I was honestly trying to move to the Midwest to maybe settle down and possibly retire. And I, you know, it didn't really play out that way, but um, when I got out here, there was already, so that when you when talk about Michigan, they, the Mongols tried to start a Michigan chapter without going through the proper channels. Um, and when I moved out here, we found out about it and shut it down. So when you there was, I think there was one or two guys that lived there. Um, but when you hear that, they probably went to something and tried to make a presence and and get this chapter established. And it didn't really get off the ground. They they've had in an Indiana chapter since I think two thousand and five, two thousand six. They had Indiana, or maybe two thousand seven was right around the time I joined. But there was one chapter there at the time. Um, and then Arkansas had had some chapters. But outside of that, we really didn't have much. We um, we had a small chapter in Kansas City, but when I moved here, there was two members. Um, so when I came out here, you know, I was mainly doing jujitsu, went to work, was working. And um, I don't know if this is someone that you guys took a training from or not, but so uh, I started out here when I was doing my mental health therapy. I started out with, I was doing both um, 
drug and alcohol counseling. And then I was running a group for uh, perpetrators of domestic violence called Men Challenging Violence. And I was teaching men, you know, kind of a feminist perspective and not how to how not to treat how not to hit women and how to treat women. Um, so I was doing this training and there was this big thing called the meth conference. Um, and it was, you know, it was at a college campus. And what they did is like they had, you know, these little kind of like breakaway courses. I'm sure you guys have been to trainings like that where there's like a, everyone gets together for the overall and then you can break away and take separate side classes. Well, one of the breakaway classes was called Outlaw Motorcycle Gangs. And, uh, you know, I was pretty intrigued. I was like, cool, I'm going to check this out. You know, I just moved out here. There's no way that no one out here knows who I am. And I get in there. And it was a, a state police detective that I guess is in that outlaw motorcycle gang investigators unit. Um, and I'm sitting in there and he's just staring at me. And I kept thinking, I'm just being arrogant. There's no way this guy knows who I am. Well, he slams his computer and he walks out and another detective comes in and says, oh, you know, a detective, I don't want to say his name, but detective so-and-so had to leave. And uh, we're just going to do one on street gangs instead. Well, just like what happened to me at the state or at, at the training back in Oregon, they pulled me out and they accused me of being like a, a uh, they thought I was infiltrating this training so that I could see what this guy's training was, what, what they talk about. And, and he made it like this big secrecy thing. Like, you know, the bikers can't see this training about bikers. It was a big deal. So I got kicked out and they, they actually tried to get me fired from my, from my job, which didn't pan out for them. Tried to get me kicked out of my, out of my gym by telling them, you know, Hey, the Mongols are infiltrating and they're doing all this stuff. They went to the police here in Mount Vernon and try to try to say, keep ticketing them and get them out of town. And, so I went from coming out here to retire to things getting pretty hot. Um, and thankfully things, things worked out, but at the time I didn't really have any interest in, in growing out here. I, I, I had been doing all the major sit downs with the outlaws for several years. I was the main one that talked with them and I knew this was their area. You know, I'd spoke with them and let them know I was going to live here. Um, when I moved here, I was hanging out with them quite a bit as a friend and as a guest. Um, and I was really, you know, kind of establishing that relationship. So there wasn't a huge interest in growing the area right away. Um, when it did happen, there was a group that came from the hardcore scene, um, uh, and so we had a lot of mutual friends and kind of younger guys. But they were all big weightlifting guys and a lot of tattoos, and they were all riding. And, and I guess they'd been hanging out with some of the other local clubs, but they didn't really fit in. And we really hit it off. And they, they one day they just asked me if they, if, if they could start a chapter and if they could join the club. Um, and I, like I said, I didn't really want to do it, so I put a lot of thought into it. And I was talking back and forth with Little Dave. Um, most of these guys lived in Illinois on the like Alton side. But out of respect for the outlaws, we didn't want to, you know, just I told them I wasn't out here to start chapters. So I didn't want to just come in here and be a liar and step on their toes. So we kicked off the St. Louis chapter. And I think that's when law enforcement started really noticing we were there is because we were very active. It was pretty big on social media. Uh, it was very similar to when we started in Oregon. A lot of the St. Louis clubs didn't want us there. I uh, did a lot of sit downs, a lot of clubs, started building some relationships there. From there, I, I started rebuilding Kansas City. Um, several years later, we kicked off Lake of the Ozarks. Um, Indiana grew to about four chapters. Nashville started a chapter. Um, and then things, um, things with the outlaws kind of started falling apart over different, different regions, different reasons. And some of our agreements fell apart. Um, and so I started a Southern Illinois chapter. And at that time I also started the Chicago chapter, which is probably what you're talking about as far as what's been reported in the media a lot. Well, and I want to throw it some, throw something at you that I reported in the last like 48 hours and it kind of, it plays into what, what you're saying. So, you know, the, the Chicago Tribune put out a story last fall predicting a war between the Mongols and the outlaws, uh, referencing a couple shootouts that had occurred. Nobody was uh, killed, but there were people that were wounded uh, in 21 and then in 22. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say uh, I, I don't I, I'm not an investigative reporter, so, I, you know, I, I don't it's different research agenda. But I, I just know from talking to some Chicago outlaws off the record that. Sometimes how you frame things can. Uh, shift the meaning. So, for example, like telling me like about the so-called Italian mafia outlaw alliance that a guy was telling me. Do we know some of the Italians? Sure. Do some of them know us? Yeah. Do we run into each other sometimes and maybe have a right. drink or something? But 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 if you say alliance, then it becomes sort of conspiratorial. Mm -hmm. And right. he was telling me there, there's nothing like there's nothing like that in place. It's not like we sit down like in the Godfather. Well, with, with I'm, the, I'm not uh, trying to push back so, on your guy, Jimmy, but yeah. I mean, in 2000. I'm, but I'm just talking about with the Italians. I don't. I don't. No, know I'm, about, but I'm talking about the Italians too. I mean, in, yeah. in 2008, the bus that took down. Fat Mike Sarno, who was the boss of the Chicago Mafia, 
there were a number of outlaws that were indicted and convicted with him. So, I mean, but I think even in that case, they were employed by those guys, but that wasn't the organization wasn't employed by those guys. Individuals oh, okay, but you, I, mean, I, I get your saying. I, some of this we, is splitting hairs, but, split hairs for sure. but if you're an, you can't tell me if you're an outlaw that no, there's nothing going on with the Italian mafia when the boss of the Chicago mafia and three members of the outlaws are convicted together of a conspiracy to extort. Uh, video poker machine. Yeah, but you, you can't have it both ways, though. You were you were just talking about how you don't trust the government and they're liars and they're they manipulate. So, <laughs> uh, but a conviction is a conviction. I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, as of the the U.S. government considers, I will argue the conviction is a conviction thing. If you start looking at the plea bargain process and all that, and how racketeering the RICO indictment goes, I'm, I'm just saying I have zero doubt in my mind. And and Jimmy's research can can say what he says. And Justin, I'm not trying to discount what either of you are saying. Oh, man, no, more than I know for about. sure that Mike Sarno had a working relationship with the Chicago outlaws. You can define it whatever way you want. Yeah, and I don't know anything about that, man. It's not, you know, it's not a club I was in and it was an era yeah. before me. Um, but as far as like having firm, I mean, formal alliances with street gangs, it's usually not something the Mongols would do. But like, and I don't again, know what, I don't know what formality that Mike Sarno uh, made uh, with the outlaws. I just know that they were working together and Sarno was using the outlaws as muscle in, in, in a attempt to extort. Right. Yeah. I remember that. And, and, uh, shake down video poker machine. Yeah. yeah I right. know from when I was in leadership in this area, we didn't, we never did anything like that. If, if that's happening now, then that's but that, again, that was two thousand to 2000. So I'm, right. I don't know what's happening now. Well, well I mean, it, even now with, with the Chicago thing, like you were talking about, um, that's not something we ever did under my leadership and now there's new leadership. So I, I guess I just can't speak on it cause I'm not sure. Well, so let, let's talk about what, what you're doing now, Mooch. Uh, obviously, you know, you're, you're well-educated and, um, are involved in counseling, but you're also involved in a lot more than that as a content creator, author, uh, tell us about what you've got going on now and how our audience can find out more about, about what you're up to. Yeah. So after, uh, you know, I spent just about 15 years in the Mongols. Um, and eventually retired and stepped away. Um, I am just to be upfront and clear with everyone. I'm in bad standings due to my relationship with little Dave. Um, but either way, so I spent 15 years in that club when I stepped away, it really opened some doors, um, for me to start doing things that we're not allowed to do in the club. And a lot of that is doing stuff like this. Um, and so at first, my first thing was I started, um, Mondays with Mooch, which is a podcast or, you know, just a YouTube channel. And my, my goal with that is really just to kind of tell some of my life story, you know, I've lived a lot of different lives from between punk rock skinhead life, you know, jujitsu and training and then being in a one percenter club and then, you know, being a, a, a social worker and a mental health therapist. And so I really just like telling my story. So most of my episodes are, are a clip or some sort of glimpse of my story. And then when I interview people or have people on it, it's usually someone that has a different perspective about the same story. So I had like the singer to my old band was on, um, you know, I'm going to have a guy on that was in the old skinhead gang with me. Um, so it's really just focused on kind of me telling my story and and trying to keep things really positive and talk about, you know, positive, cool stuff and fun stuff that we did. Um, and then from that, I got ended up offered, got offered a book deal. Um, so it's going to be a, a book about my life. And I will say this, I did, I used to not really agree with bikers or mob guys or whoever writing, you know, profiting off of their club. But the the one thing I'll say is the Mongols was just a part of my story. And, and as we kind of glossed about or talked about today. Um, you know, the, the Mongols were a big part of my life, but it was part of my story. And so the book isn't just about the Mongols. It's about, you know, me touring and me growing up and being in the band. And then, and then, you know, me leaving the club and really getting into social work and, you know, trying to help others. Um, and then since then too, we've kind of started this thing called lift train ride movement. Where we're really trying to motivate people to stay in shape and be healthy and, and work out, you know, ride motorcycles and, you know, just do positive things. We just, uh, linked up with a, uh, well-known jujitsu guy, Tom DeBlass. We're getting on an anti-bullying campaign and, and helping him out with that. So just trying to move forward, doing some really positive stuff. A lot of the stuff that I learned growing up through Club World um, and keeping it positive. Well, yeah, awesome. I mean, it, that sounds awesome. And I, and I know that I mean, we don't have a lot of time to get into it now, but I've watched some of your videos and talking about mental health and something we share an interest in is is outreach to at-risk youth. And so I think that it's it's great what you're doing. And, and it's really important. I, I saw this in one of your other episodes where – it's really important that at-risk youth hear this from dudes like you. Like, you know, if, if I go in there, it's like, 
the square PhD, <laughs> you know, it may not resonate, but someone like you that, that that's lived the life. I think it's really important that what you're doing and it's, and I wish you well. Thank you very much. Yeah. One thing that I think people don't really understand a lot about counseling until you've done it right is that the therapist never shares his story. Cause it's not about me, but because of my appearance and how I carry myself, you're going to pick that up anyways. And I think with teenagers, it goes a super long way. And that's right now. I work with youth that are on parole probation from 12 to 17 years old that have antisocial behaviors. Um, and we really figure out what's driving the behavior and, and try and create lasting changes so that the parents and the kids can make changes when we're no longer in the home. So it's been really rewarding and really cool. Um, and then, like I said, I did the domestic violence training, too, where I'm trying to teach people not to hit their women and, and, and you know, jump into the <laughs> into the new century and and be, you know, be real men. So it's it's been really cool. And it's it's been it's been a blessing. It's been a lot of fun. I can't wait. I can't wait to read the book. Yeah, I appreciate uh, uh, your time and, and all your efforts. And yeah, when when the book comes out, um, any any uh, timeline on when we should expect that to drop? Yeah, the publisher the publisher keeps saying that's going to be out by spring, but um, I'm <laughs> I'm assuming probably early summer because um, I'm not sure how it's going to be done in two months. But um, yeah, but I mean we're getting there. We're cranking it out. Things are going really well. So def- definitely early this year or mid year. Yeah, well, we hope to have you back on when when it drops and we could talk about it. And then uh, any any uh, social media or anything you want uh, our audience to check out your stuff? Yeah, I'm on uh, Instagram. It's og underscore underscore mooch. Um, and honestly, I pride myself on the fact that I get back to everybody. So, you know, reach out, shoot a message, ask questions. If there's something I can help you with. I would love to. Um, so follow me on there. Uh, my Facebook, I kind of keep just like family and friends. So Instagram's the big one. And then, you know, um, you know, it's the Mooch on YouTube or Mondays with Mooch. Yeah, I hope I hope Mooch. I, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us and, and being as forthright as you have. You're incredibly articulate. You. Obviously, you're very intelligent based on your you know, what you've accomplished. Um, I really hope that this is the the start of a, a, a connection and a relationship between, you know, Moochin and his brand and OG podcast, because people like you are just invaluable, really, uh, that can, you know, break down from a, a break down an issue from a firsthand perspective, make it digestible to, you know, regular uh, people that haven't lived in that subculture, make it relatable. Uh, I've, I've just been blown away by this interview. So thank you so much. And I hope we can have you on more than just one more time. I hope you, you come back five or 10 more times. Yeah, I would love to, man. You know, it, it's kind of my goal to push back against this law enforcement narrative, like we talked about. And, and, you know, I've, like I said, I've listened to your guys' shows and, you know, it's funny when I hear things like, oh yeah, you know, law enforcement says, oh, that, you know, the, the Mongols started making this big move and this big push and this big presence. And me, I'm like, oh man, that was me coming out here to, to do jujitsu, you know? So being able to show the actual facts and truth behind it, I'm really happy to do and help with anytime. Yeah, well, we appreciate your time, Mooch. Good luck with everything and I'll stay in touch with you and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll uh, see you again soon. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate you having me on. Take care. Thanks everyone for listening and watching and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. OG Podcast out.